The question today is, do you ever feel as though people are out to get you? Maybe not to the point of paranoia, which is a mental disorder consisting of the irrational and persistent feeling that people are out to get you, but rather a general precaution or skepticism that you may have in protecting oneself or feeling. Out to get me is such a common occurrence. Dolly Parton in her song 9 to 5 included it at the end of the first verse when she thought her boss may be out to get her. A lot of us might think that. Neighbor, listen to this. In reality, for someone or something to be out to get you, they must first desire to have or change something you possess. Good morning, folks. I'm Troy Wilson. Let me thank you for joining us for today's 10 minutes of worship and renewal of the spirit. A special shout out today to those who are in the Ukraine fighting for their lives and those in nursing homes and hospitals and people dealing with COVID, special prayer for you. It was a cold January morning. The sun was just peeking over the horizon. At the pre-shift briefing, our lieutenant had given me an arrest warrant to be served upon a man known as Tick Maddox. Tick was a known alcoholic. However, the warrant was not for public drunkenness, but rather for arson. Tick, along with his two brothers, who were also alcoholics, lived in the rural southeast part of our county. And when our county is rural, it's rural. The one-room shack in which they presided had no electricity and no indoor plumbing. And no, it was not 100 years ago. Actually, it was in the mid-1980s. Driving up the long dirt drive, I saw no movement around the outside of the small weather-beaten house to which they resided. Signing off my radio, I take my stream light, flashlight, then enter through the opening where the front door would normally be. I said normally be because the door was actually missing. At first glimpse, I can make out three grown men laying across one double bed, all sleeping or passed out. They were using a rug off of the floor as cover. Apparently, there were no blankets in the house to be had, and it was bitter cold. Tick was the first to wake, then sat up, stared into my stream light while rubbing his eyes. He asked, what's going on, man? After going through the normal preliminaries of making the arrest and reading the arrest warrant, Tick then asked if he could have one last beer, which was under his bed, before I take him to jail. I gave him permission to do so, then watched closely as he retrieved it. Upon popping the top of the can, Tick encounters a new problem. The beer was froze solid. Now, with the most perplexed look on his face, Tick asked if I had something he could pry the top open with. Now, I know this sounds dumb to most people, and, and it normally would be, but I reached in my pocket, retrieved my pocket knife, opened the small blade, and handed it to him. Then stepping back, I watched as he began cutting off the top of the beer can. As he continued ripping away at the metal, I asked Tick why he was setting fires to all the fields and woods in his neighborhood. His reason was this. He was tired of seeing the forestry trucks just riding up and down the road, so he thought he would give them something to do. Now, I, I know my Uncle Haywood or David West would have loved to heard that. But at the conclusion of that statement, I just began hastening him along, telling him, we got to go. Tick complied by quickly began eating the beer from the can using my pocket knife as a spoon. Now, although this entire event has burned a vivid memory into my brain for the rest of my life, this part is one which stands out most of all. When Tick was finished eating his beer, I retrieved my pocket knife, then said to him, Tick, Get your stuff, and let's go. By stuff, I meant money, medications, things he could turn in at, at the detention center desk to be used later on. However, once again, Tick is looking at me with a puzzled stare. Get my stuff, he asked. Then he said these words. I don't have anything to get. Friend, let's think about that for a moment. If it had not been for setting fires, not one person in the entire world would have been out to get Tick Maddox. Tick lived in what most would consider the bottom of life. No money, no possessions, 
no prestigious position. He had nothing anyone else would want. If one remembers the oldie goldie song by Janis Joplin, me and Bobby McGee, you may also recall the words in the song where she sings, freedom is just another word for nothing else to lose. And she may have a point. With the exception of the arrest warrant, Tick was as free as it gets, at least while he was on this earth. Now, one might say, well, Brother Troy, I like my possessions, my position, my friends, and family. I don't want anyone taking what I work for. Truth is, I like those things God has entrusted me with also. However, Jesus Christ himself has given us special instructions on how we should prioritize those things. Let's read it. Luke 14, chapter, and the 26th verse. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, many attack this verse because Jesus is using the word hate. However, this word in the Hebrew and Greek language had several different meanings from those we see in today's English dictionaries. What does the word hate mean in Greek? It means to love less. The word in Hebrew covers a wide range of meaning, meaning an emotion ranging from intense hatred to simply sit against. So don't use this passage of scripture as an excuse not to obey the teachings of Jesus Christ. To make it a little more clear what Jesus is saying though, let's read this next verse together, very short. And everyone that hath forsaken houses and brethren, our sisters, our father, our mother, our wife, our children, our lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Wouldn't that be great? Folks, when we put God first above all other earthly connections, we no longer care if others are out to get what we have. Not only do we no longer care about those attempting to take what we have, we want them to have it. Did you get that? The Bible tells us this. Let's read this last passage of scripture because it is the ultimate cure for paranoia. It can be found in Matthew chapter 5 verses 42 through 44. Give to him that ask it thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. For ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. One might say, Brother Troy, I can't do that. Maybe not in your carnal state, but when you have the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ living in you, you can through Him, through His love which dwells in us. We can love with His love. Don't you want to live like that? You can. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us to a place of nothingness. It was in our nothingness of all the things of this world, we found our everything through your son, Jesus Christ. Dear God, we thank you for the gift of eternal life with you in heaven. May we always remember to give freely of those things you have given to us. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen and amen.